Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast. So grateful that you've taken some time out of your busy, busy schedule to learn and grow. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with me. That's a Jay-Z line if you didn't know. If you're even a little bit curious about investing passively in real estate or other alternative investments, I encourage you to go to attorneybydesign.com, whether you're an attorney or not, and download the Freedom Blueprint and schedule a call with me as soon as you can. You'll be off to the races in no time. All right. I preach time and time again that having one stream of income is the riskiest financial situation you can put yourself in. Even if you're an all-star, even if you're a doctor or a lawyer, even if you're moving up that corporate ladder like it's on fire, we still need to make money while we sleep. What happens if you stop working? What if you get sick? What happens if you stop billing your hours or seeing clients? The money train comes to a screeching halt. Unless you become an intelligent alternative investor, you have multiple streams of income, then you can withstand and even thrive during adversity. I'm jamming today with Dr. Eric Tate, who has mastered these concepts as a highly paid, highly competent, and highly successful physician. Eric is an investment fund manager with Vernonville Asset Management, a private investment firm that helps investors attain and or maintain financial independence using alternative assets. Eric is also a physician who is board certified in internal medicine. Under Eric, Vernonville has grown to over $100 million in assets internationally and domestically, including the Hilton Curio Resort in Belize, triple net commercial assets, multifamily apartment homes, student housing, specialty coffee farms in Panama, and dozens of single family homes, private lending funds, and angel investments. Stoked to have Eric on the show today. Let's go. This is the Passive Income Attorney Podcast, where you'll discover the secrets and strategies of the ultra wealthy on how they build streams of passive income to give them the freedom we all want. Attorney Seth Bradley will help you end the cycle of trading your time for money so you can make money while you sleep. Start living the good life on your own terms. Now, here's your host, Seth Bradley. Dr. Eric Tate, what is going on, brother? Welcome to the show. Hey, Seth. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate uh, being here. Absolutely. I know you're a busy guy, man, so I appreciate you coming on. What's, uh, let's just jump right in, man. What's your story? Feel free to brag a little bit. Take it back as far as you want. Oh, yeah, not a problem. So it actually goes back to, we'll take it back to college, right? right. Um, and so I knew I was going to be a physician from when I was like six years old. Uh, went to college, went to the same college my uncle went to, who was an oral surgeon. Um, but I always had an entrepreneurial bug, uh, even growing up. Like most people in college didn't even realize that I was pre-med. I had We ran a general store kind of out of our dorm room my freshman year. So I've always been fairly entrepreneurial. And then I knew when I was heading to medical school that the medical schools I was looking at, because um, I had done research at Penn for two summers and they had Wharton there. I was like, oh, maybe I can do a dual degree MD, MBA program. Uh, and the school where a lot of guys from, from my college went, uh, they, had an, they were literally setting up an MD, MBA program when I was a sophomore in college. And I pretty much figured that if I go there, I won't have to take the, G, the GMAT I'll probably just take my MCAT scores, and that's exactly what happened. So I ended up coming to Houston uh, from Atlanta and went to Baylor College of Medicine for medical school, Rice for business school. When I got into business school, I realized very quickly, this is the summer of 2000, that the boys and girls on Wall Street really didn't know what the heck they were doing. Um, you know, if, if you know Houston in 2000, uh, that Crooked Letter company was, was a big recruiter. And, and don't get me wrong, I have a lot of friends who work there. But Enron was an eye opener because we were doing their financial statements in our financial accounting class, my first ever kind of financial class. And I'll never forget the professor said that in 97, 98, 99, they had made no money from core operations and the IRS could classify them as a hobby. And at the same time, their stock was still going up. And I was like, okay, either the folks on Wall Street don't know or they don't care. Either way, I don't want my money there. And so I've never been a stock and bond guy, not a mutual fund person. Went out, tried to figure out how to make money. And the, the two ways you get wealthy quickly is either owning a non-service-based business um, and real estate. So I went out to real estate, uh, really pretty much in med school, bought my condo, rented it out when I was in residency, and then kind of went from there. 
That's awesome, man. I love that you figured out the, the Wall Street hustle early, man. It took me a little bit of time. I was kind of putting the, the funds into the 401k and, and saying, you know, I'm just going to work at this big law firm and, you know, call it a day nine to five. Well, not really nine to five. But we'll call it nine to five till 65 and then sip the coconuts, man. But that's, you know, it took me a few years to figure it out. But that's awesome. You figured that out early. Yeah, I was lucky. So what happened was my college, I'll, I'll always give my college roommate credit. One of my, another different, different college roommate credit. Um, so he called me when I was first year med school. He's like, hey man, you got to read this book. I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, hey man, the stuff we were talking about in college, because we were looking at buying some real estate in college. Hey, you know, this guy, this purple book guy, you read this, right? And so for those of you who all realize it's Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He started writing that in 1997, 98 is when it really came out. That's when I started in the medical school. So I was reading as he was writing each of those books. So I was literally reading the cash flow quadrant in business school. So as I was doing actual balance sheets, I was looking at it and said, these things don't look the same. I'm like, I want to be over here with the, with the cash flow quadrant balance sheet. Um, and so I really just got lucky and was able to just, just take action. So I had the reinforcement of what I was doing in formal education, but then also seeing what was happening kind of in this non-formal education where, where the two were syncing up. And so it made it very easy for me to move forward and just take that action. Yeah. Yeah. Those books are life changers, man. Those should be required reading for middle schoolers, right? I mean, you should be taught that in grade school from an early age. So you can start forming those, those opinions and opening up your mind to that abundance mentality and, and to entrepreneurship. And it's not just that nine to five till 65 mindset. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why I play cash flow one-on-one with my kids. There you go. There you go, man. You're starting the movement, starting the movement. All right, man. Do you still practice medicine? I do. So pre-COVID, uh, I was seeing patients. So, so my journey was I came out, uh, started buying real estate. So for the first 10 years, I was four days a week in medicine. Um, one day a week, I, I reserved for building my own thing, building kind of the, the wealth platform side of things. So I ended up taking less money to, so I could have more of my time. Um, and then after 10 years, uh, which was about five years ago, I was able to make more money from my investments and I was making practicing medicine. So I flipped it because I still like practicing. And so what one day a week medicine, four days a week, kind of the entrepreneurial, um, kind of thing from that standpoint. And then post COVID, uh, we see patients kind of as needed, uh, because most of my patient base is over 65 and I want them to get vaccinated. So I'll see them maybe once or twice during the year, kind of ad hoc. And then in 2022, we'll probably start scheduling back in. Gotcha. Now, now you've scaled your real estate business, uh, you know, to amazing levels. Do you ever think you're going to walk away from practice 100%? Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, I practice now because I like to, not because I have any necessary reason to do it. Um, if it gets to the point where it costs me to practice medicine, I might walk away. Um, and, and not because I wouldn't necessarily want to do a couple of shifts here or there. The problem is my schedule is just so fluid, which is really how I designed my life. My whole goal was time freedom. It wasn't really ever about money. It was about how do I control my time? Um, and so if there's a way for me to practice medicine that doesn't cost me money, that still allows me time freedom, I'll continue to do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, you know, is there any particular advice that you give to doctors or, or other professionals, attorneys, uh, dentists, things like people like that who are, you know, they're looking to invest in real estate, but maybe they don't want to transition out like you, you know, how, how do they get started? Like what, what would be the first step that you suggest? Yeah. So for busy professionals, and like most of our investors, they are, they're doctors, lawyers, engineers, people are super busy entrepreneurs. Um, you have the, the biggest thing you have to decide first, I tell people is what are you trying to accomplish financially? We'll just start there, right? Because if there's, if, if what you're doing is not tied to a goal, then you're not going to do it, right? Because Wall Street had, and the financial services community has just inundated us with, as you say, the 401k, nine to five, pray, hope everything is there at the end. That people think that that is the safe pathway. People think that is the pathway that it's a pathway of least resistance, right? And what I tell people all the time is if you do what everybody else does, you're going to get what everybody else gets. And so if you don't want to be 95 to 65, you have to do something differently, right? And so, but that's an abstraction. But when you sit down, because like with us, with our investors, when they contact us, we give them a, a free 30 minute consult, right? So I'm just going to talk to them but not about our deals. We're going to talk to them about what they're trying to accomplish financially. So we always start there because in the end, it doesn't matter if it's the financial services industry, it doesn't matter if it's somebody with a real estate deal, they've got their own agenda. What you have to do is bring your agenda to the table and say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want my life to look like. This is what I want my capital to do for me today, tomorrow, and in the future. So first things first, we start with that. And so if what your goals align with what whoever's doing, you know, one of your deals, whatever the case may be, then the next step is, okay, 
do you want to be active or passive? So first, goals. Second, active versus path, passive. Once those two things are figured out, now you can go down a particular pathway because then you have to learn specific things. It's not rocket science. High school people are multi, multi-millionaires doing a lot of this stuff. So it doesn't take brain power, right? What it takes is focused attention on the pathway that will most closely align with your goals. And so what you don't want to do is, is to use your money to fund other people's goals. Doesn't mean you won't make money, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're getting your specific goal, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. So let's say somebody says, okay, I want to take an active side. I have a little bit more time, or maybe I only practice part-time. What pathway would you suggest? How would you take them down that way? Yeah. So first of all, you have to find a mentor. You have to find somebody who who does active investing in the way that you like to do it, right? Because especially if we're talking about real estate, if we're talking about other things, a different discussion. But real estate is not difficult, but it is counterintuitive. For the, for the non-trained real estate person, the thing you think you should do, you absolutely should not do. The thing you absolutely think you should not do is actually the thing you're supposed to do. Um, and until somebody shows that to you, it's really, really counterintuitive in many ways. And so if you're like, hey, I want to be active. Okay, do you want to be active in single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, multifamily, single tenant, triple nets, uh, short-term rentals? Like there's a million things that you can do. So then you have to figure out, okay, I want to do this. It seems interesting to me go find a mentor, go find training. I'm a big personal development guy. I'm a big conference goer. So I pay people to teach me how to make money. And I have no problems doing that. So I always tell everybody, if you're going to be active, you have to find a mentor. Agreed, man. It's a, it's a shortcut to success, man. I mean, you got to, if you, if you want to do something and do it well and do it and learn how to do it quickly, you've got to find somebody that's already doing it well and, you know, pay them or whatever you have to do. Let them take you, take you under their wing, whatever it takes, man. You've, you've got to find mentors. You got to find coaches. You got to find people to help you along the way. Yep. And if you're not going to pay them, you have to have, you have to have something of equal value to them. People sure. are always looking for mentors, but from a take standpoint, they very rarely are like, Hey, what do you guys need? So I can learn from you cool. You, you, how many solicitations I get from people? Can I mentor? Can you take some of your time? Can I have this, that, and the other? And I'm busy, right? right. I'm, I, I am busy. I just don't have the time to do all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, so lead with lead with how you can help a potential mentor or, or pay them. Yeah, for sure, man. All right. What about passive? Let's go down that pathway. Yeah, passive is, is much easier. You still have to learn some things, but what you have to learn is what asset classes you want to be in. And then you just have to find a group of people that you vibe with, right? There are enough people out there who are doing large passive deals. You can find out very quickly who's doing, who's real and who's not, right? The, the people are always worried, oh, they're going to send my money and they're going to run away with it. You can vet enough people to figure out that quickly. If you get enough social, social circles, you'll know who's real and who's not. The, the key is not going to be somebody running away with your money. The key is kind of, are they competent, right? Are they competent? Are they, do they have their backstop in place? Um, and here's the thing, track record is great, but everybody had to start somewhere. Look, you really have to look at the team that they put together. So they can be a novice, but really look at the team that they've put together um, because a team can substitute their experience. And I'm also a big proponent of, especially if you're going in with people who are raising capital, that the people who are raising capital are not just capital raisers, that they've been actual operators. They've actually had to pay contractors, had to do, you know, had to be in the trenches, make a payroll on a project, bring it in on time, on budget, you know, deal with, 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 with lenders, understand kind of property reports, right? Because there are a lot of people running around these days, aggregating capital from, from high net worth people, but they themselves, if you said, hey, here's a project, go do it. They wouldn't have the foggiest idea how to put together the team and any of that. And so those of us who are actual operators in a prior life, we can vet the people that we partner with because we're like, we've done this. Like, you know, give me all the, the details. I'll do all the due diligence myself. And then I can go to, hey, we need to think about this. Hey, we need to do, hey, we need to cost seg this out. Hey, we need, you know, I've got a roofer that can do this for this. So that we're, that the people you're, you're partnering with are adding value to the overall team and not just bringing money to the table, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense, man. If you if you don't have that hands-on experience, if you haven't owned real estate or developed a property or you know operated the property on the back end, you know it, it's hard to get a real understanding and bring those numbers that are on a spreadsheet to life. And and, and it's hard to just grasp that. It's hard to understand that from a business standpoint and to you know perp perpetrate things to, to to propel things to get them uh, moving forward and execute that business plan on the back end. 
Absolutely. Yeah, man. Um, so you had mentioned goals as well. I mean, you know, what are some of the goals that your clients come to you when you have that first call? You know, what are their pain points and, you know, where, you know, where they want to take this thing? Yeah. And, and so a lot of it is unconscious. And so we, we take them through a process to, to make the unconscious conscious, right? To take them through a process and to think about their life and their money in a way that's no one else has really taken them through. Most of our investors are looking, they, they like or love what they do. It's just at a level in terms of intensity that they want to cut back on, but they don't want to forego the lifestyle benefits that having a law degree, a medical degree, a dental degree, being an entrepreneur affords them, right? So it's the conundrum box, right? I want to work less, but I don't want to get paid less. How do I do that, right? And that's really where a lot of it comes, at least for those who come to us on the real estate side for our passive income kind of projects. Like we have some, you know, venture stuff that's capital gains and they're coming for a different kind of thing, those folks. But on the real estate side, it's really, hey, I like what I do. I just want to do it less than on my own terms. Cool. That makes life very easy, right? Because like for me, that was my whole goal myself. And all I did was open up my investment portfolio to other people to join us so we can do bigger projects. And so it was a perfect alignment for me because it was the thing that I did to got to get personally free myself uh, from that standpoint. And so that's really kind of the pain point for people is that they don't necessarily, there are a few that just want to get out completely, but like on the attorney side, they'd much rather do pro bono work for whatever cause that they care. So they're still using the, the legal side, but they don't want to have to get paid necessarily to do that, right? And so giving them the option of being able and seeing a pathway to freedom to say, oh crap, when people get that first passive income check from just putting money into a deal, it changes who you are at your core being. Because you realize, even if you haven't replaced all your income or replaced your expenses yet, you now realize that you can do it and it's possible. And once it's possible, I find that people end up having a satisfaction and like, oh, you know what? This stuff I do every day is not so bad. And, they, and it almost reframes their day-to-day -day living. And until you've gone through it, I can't, I can't really explain it to you. But once you've gone through, and I guarantee you there are people in, in your audience who are like, yeah, I remember when that happened. I remember those checks when they're coming. Yeah, I feel differently. You literally are a different person when those checks come to you. Um, and so I, I tell people, just, just, just try it, right? Just start baby steps and then build because it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's right. I mean, it, it's like buying back your time piece by piece. I always say that when you start getting that first distribution check, you're like, oh, all right, well, I got $1,000 a month coming in from that. And then you just keep building and building and building. And eventually you're like, oh, well, maybe I can cut back part time. I don't have to build 2,200 hours this year. I can, I can go half time. Um, Cause it, a lot of times, like you said, it's not about, you know, the work itself. People don't mind it. Doctors, lawyers, we don't mind the work. It's all the stuff that comes with it. It's having to work, you know, a thousand times more than we want to. It's having a thousand bosses. It's doing all this, you know, administration stuff that we don't want to do. The stuff that comes along with it is the problem, not necessarily the work and the, the work itself, you know, helping patients, you know, helping business people solve their problems. That stuff is great. It's just all the bureaucracy that comes with it. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And especially on the, on the physician side because nothing happens in the field without us, but we control nothing in the field. Right. That cognitive dissonance creates massive internal turmoil. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so what approach do you recommend to your colleagues? I mean, do you say, you know, even if they want to go active, a lot of times I'll say, look, man, maybe you should do this passively first just to kind of get your feet wet, see how it goes. You know, we'll, we'll give you a look behind the curtain and check it out if you invest passively. And then, you know, once you feel it out, maybe try to go actively or, you know, most of the time they end up seeing those checks coming in. They're like, oh, we'll just invest passively. So, I, well, I, I let them lead me where they want to be. But the quickest way to okay. get a, somebody to be an active investor, I mean, a passive investor is make, let them go be an active investor. After four <laughs> units, they'll come kicking and screaming back because not, not that it's hard, it's just, it's just a nuisance, right? And so I'm happy to let people go active, right? Like, uh, we, we think we're going to do both. Absolutely, no problem. I've got a turnkey, turnkey single family guy in Central Florida. Call him, he'll make sure you don't get in trouble. Like, like I'm happy to refer people out. But I know after the fourth unit, you're going to look for some passive stuff because that's what I did, right? We've got dozens of single family homes. I wouldn't buy another single family home if you, if you gave it to me at this point, right? Not because it's difficult, but it's just, I don't want to spend my time on that. But some people have to experience it. Cool, not a problem. And if, and if people are going after kind of real estate professional status, 
then having three or four kind of active deals that you're doing to then be able to use the big depreciation that we're able to give off of the larger projects, that's actually a pretty smart strategy. The other strategy I have people do oftentimes is 529s, right? Instead of a 529, when a kid is born, just buy a single family rent house in a middle, middle market area, right? You don't need the cash flow, put it into, put, essentially put that into an account somewhere. You can pay extra mortgage payments if you want, but by the time, 18 years from now, it will be paid off. It'll probably be worth about 250, 300. That's gonna cover a good chunk of a child's education, right? And then you don't have to sell it. You can cash out refinance if you want. That's a tax-free event. You pay for it. Now you still got the asset. It can be part of your retirement portfolio because you're probably gonna be working another 10 years after your kids go to college. Like all of those things, you get the flexibility of owning the asset, but somebody else is paying for your kids to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and so that's the other kind of, if you're gonna be active, hey, get a couple for a specific investment purpose for down the road. Yeah, yeah. A couple great takeaways there, man. I, I don't think people understand how much goes into it when they watch, you know, HGTV or something and they're watching those flips and they're like, okay, 30 minutes. Look at that. We can, we can flip this house and make $50,000 just like that. It doesn't go down like that, especially if you're doing it from a distance and, and different things that are going on. You're trying to manage those contractors and the property managers and, you know, everything else. It is, it, it can turn into a mess pretty quickly if you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and flipping is different than, you know, holding for, for income. Right. And that's a, right. like, I don't even flip, I've never done a flip. And so I can't even pretend to talk about that from that same, I renovated properties, but trying to then make it pretty and sell it out. No, no, no. I, that, I have no experience in that. <laughs> yeah. And then you mentioned the 529. That's an awesome, awesome tool, man. Uh, instead of, you know, just having to save just this massive chunk of cash, uh, for your for your kids' college funds, buy a piece of real estate and just let it take care of itself. Yep, yep, that's what we did. That's literally our, that is literally, my kids are 11 and nine and their college is already paid off, right? And it wasn't me saving money anywhere. That way, that money I would have quote unquote saved goes into other investments, right? And so you're, you're able to accelerate leverage and increase the velocity of your own internal investment strategy by doing this. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's switch gears a little bit because I really wanted to ask you about this and you probably have heard it from some of the people that you talk to on the phone and, and you can kind of tell that they're, they might be a little unhappy with their lives. You know, even though we're some of the, the highest paid professionals as attorneys and doctors, you know, we're sometimes some of the most unhappy humans and it shows up in suicide rates and broken marriages and addictions and things like that. I mean, why do you think that is? So a lot of it, again, it's back to that locus of control, right? Um, I, can, I, can, I can speak probably more because my eldest sister is an attorney, but she loves what she does. She prosecutes attorneys and judges. So she actually has a fulfillment in the law, right? Um, so I can speak more intelligently around the physician space sure. um, than I can about the attorney space. But even then, a lot of it is just kind of fulfillment, right? And so we're often the most driven um, highest scoring, always the A student types of people. But once we come out, at least, you know, on the physician side, once we're out as practicing attendings, that's it. That's a, that's the pinnacle, right? If you're in academics, maybe you can move up this kind of artificial of assistant professor, professor, whatever, right? But in the end, what you do, this is what you're doing for the rest of your life. There's no more, more than this, right? So one, that can become very groundhoggish, right? Same thing every day, every day, every day. Now you layer on the fact that unless you're a cash receiving physician from your patients, you have no control over the system, but the system cannot work without you, right? That's a very disconcerting feeling as I talked about it, that amount of cognitive dissonance that you don't have autonomy over your practice environment, right? And so that will also come in on the, on the attorney side of the world. Just you've got this system that sits over you that it, it can't work without you, but you can't change it, right? Those of us who are entrepreneurs, we change our systems daily. Like, oh, I don't like this. I'm doing something else. Oh, you know what? This isn't working. We're gonna do something different, right? So we have full autonomy as being an entrepreneur, whereas kind of these pinnacle for professions, like I like to call them, there's not a lot of autonomy. And for people who've always been driven, always been the top of this, always been this, when you finally hit the pinnacle, you realize, oh crap, this isn't what I expected. So we call it kind of an, an, an expectations reality mismatch, right? And so some of it is just an expectation level was, was set up badly from the front end. 
a lot of it is just reframing how you think about your what it is that you do. Easier said than done. Oftentimes requires therapy, but <laughs> you know. But that's really what it is. It's an expectations life mismatch because the person who's outside digging ditches would trade places with either one of us tomorrow and would never complain because they have the experience of something different and realizing that what we do on the grand scheme and relatively speaking is way easier, right? We don't feel it when we're in it, but if we could trade places with somebody else who's experienced their life and then trade with our life, they like, oh my God, we do this in a heartbeat. But again, I don't like, I don't like to to denigrate people's pain. So I'm not saying that people aren't in pain, but there's a relative question around that in terms of, okay, well, let me put you out here with a ditch digger and pay you $10 an hour. And then, sure. and then let me, and then let's see how much you, how, how, how quickly you might come back to this once you've had a new perspective. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's all about those expectations and, and where you're at in life and, and how you perceive the world. Um, do you ever find yourself being that therapist on the phone to, to some of your clients? <laughs> oh my God. So like you know, primary care, it's 70% that, and yes. And it's not therapy. It is what I try to be as a, as a mirror reflection. That's what that first call is about, right? It has nothing to do with me. It has everything for them to get out of them, things that they never have ever thought about, right? Things that they have never, no one has ever asked them. Again, it doesn't matter to me. It's just here, this is what you want. Let me make sure that you, that you make the unconscious conscious that we can all lay it out here no heat, no judgment. Tell me what you want. Like I, I, I go, I take them through a CGI process, right? If I wave my magic wand and this could be this, how does that feel? Well, if I could, no, no, I don't, no could, I'm giving it to you. What does that look like, right? Taking them through that and no one's ever like, oh, well, I can actually architect my own life. Like, yes, you can actually architect your own life. Lay it out first and then we'll give you the pathway on which to, to how to do that, right? So it's not therapy, but it's really just getting people to voice what they probably squished down trying to get to these pinnacle professions. I'm giving them the, the permission to bring it back up and really voice it, not because, and people squelch it because they think they can't get it. So if they think they just push it down, then it goes away, but it doesn't, it just gnaws at you. That's that feeling of burnout. That's that feeling of, whoa, there's something else there. I can't voice it. No one's giving me a chance to voice it, but it all, the unconscious, always becomes conscious right yeah and yeah. so what we do is give them an out that says well if you get your time back you can figure out some of the things that you like and figure out a way to put all of it together so that you can move forward in a way that's holistic and works to so your your professional life your personal life your social life your hobbies all of that comes back into a round better balance wheel love that man sounds like you know the right questions to ask to pull pull that deep stuff right out of them right yeah, I, I, I paid a lot of money to, to, to learn how to do that. <laughs> there you go, man. All right. Well, let's let's go really quickly. I know you have a lot of stuff going on, but what's your current business look like? Yeah. So as we talked earlier, I, I, you know, I used to do operations. So I still run all of my single family stuff. I ran the multifamily operations and realized I don't like operations. I can do it, but I just don't like it. Um, so now what I spend most of my time is investor relations. Um, so we do a lot of newsletters. We do a lot of um, information because I'm actually running two investment companies, one on the venture side and then Vernonville, which does real estate, private debt and, and angel investing. And there's a little bit of a difference between angel and venture investing. Um, so creating new content, talking to investors and then really understanding on a macroeconomic analysis, kind of, I've been talking about inflation for 10 years, right? All now of a sudden it's, it's come up, but it's always been there. It's been in asset classes, right? Which is why we do a lot of hard asset stuff. So folks who have been riding with us have been getting all that appreciation because we've been talking about it because we understand what the Fed does. And so my job is really macroeconomic analysis, understanding where we want to be, and then going finding those operational teams that we can partner with, place capital with, and feel confident that they will deliver to us the returns that we're, we're wanting. So kind of investor relations and then kind of due diligence kind of stuff. That's what I spend my time doing. And we're kind of asset class agnostic. We own coffee plantations. We own um, hotel, Hilton hotels in, thir in, in the Caribbean. We own light industrial. We've built some student housing. You know, To us, it's really more about market team asset. The asset is the least important thing. It's fungible. What we need to understand is what market problems, what, what problems a market has and find the team that can solve it. So again, we own a lot of different kinds of stuff. But I can tell you the problem that each of those things solves in our markets. Love that, man. Yeah, find the right team. It's it's who, not how, right? Yeah, right, man. Absolutely. Let, 
All right, man, let's jump into the Freedom Four. It's time for the Freedom Four. What's the best thing you do to keep your mind and body healthy? Oh, uh, exercise, right? It's just, it's just exercise. Cause I have, I mean, my vices are cigars and alcohol. And so I have to, uh, exercise, right. Cause that, that's kind of my, my chill, relax, think, think time. Yeah. Um, and so exercise is, is key and, and different functional types of exercise. And I'm, and I'm by no means a, an exercise guru, but stay moving, whatever that is, stay flexible, stay moving, um, from, from that standpoint. Cool, cool. What's one life hack or piece of technology you use to be your most productive self? Oh, my CRM system, customer relationship management system and software. It keeps all of our investors um, kind of in one house. It can keep a lot of data and, and we can send out lots of information in one kind of click to everybody. And then we can also then segregate people based upon their interests. So without a CRM system, I couldn't do this. Cool, what do you use? Uh, Active campaign. <laughs> Cool. Yep. Same here, man. Same of here. Of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's one actionable step our listeners can do right now to start creating more freedom, more autonomy? Uh, don't be afraid to write what their real goals are and then take action steps towards them. The problem is, especially those of us at Pinnacle Professions is we tend to have B-type personalities and don't take don't have a bias towards action. So we will over overanalyze and analysis paralysis. Find your goal figure out your goal and then find somebody who can help you with it and then take massive action towards it. Awesome. Awesome. Last but not least, how has passive income made your life better? It's given me freedom, right? Again, I'm not money motivated. I'm time motivated, right? So I'm sitting here with you. Uh, I took my kids to, to camp, did a quick jog around the block, took a shower. We're doing this podcast. I'm going to go to lunch with my wife. We've got, then I'm going with my partners to go walk a uh, light industrial portfolio I can do all of that because I have time, right? And so for me, passive income gave me all the time, gave me all of my time back. Absolutely, man. You got to change that mindset from earning the money to earning your time back so that you can spend it the way that you want to spend it with the people you want to spend it with. All right, man, Absolutely. it's been great. Uh, where can our listeners find out more about you? Yeah, so I'm, 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 I tell people I'm infinitely Googleable. My last name is T-A-I-T. Um, but the easiest way, if you want to kind of get kind of on our newsletter list or things of that nature. It's uh, vernonville.com. So V-E-R-N-O-N-V-I-L-L-E.com. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter list and that 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 stuff all comes to me from that standpoint. Um, for, for, the, for the physicians out there, I created a, a kind of life balance wheel for physicians called the Physician's Road, uh, R-O-A-D.com. You can go on there. It's free. Um, we've had some podcasts up there up in five kind of different areas, kind of your practice, your, per, your professional life, your social life, um, your wealth, um, and your relationships, right? And so we have experts who have come in, we have downloadable materials, and it's all free, right? There's nothing, you know, that was my give back to my profession because of all the burnouts, because of all the suicide rates. Um, kind of how can you structure a life where you can actually structure your path? And so the physiciansroad.com, you can, you can reach me through there as well. Um, and, and, if, and if you don't want to reach out to me, just take the free resources and use them as, as you need them. That's and that's awesome, actually, and, and, in all honesty, anyone can use it outside of the practice, which is specific to medicine. The other things we talk about are for any busy professional. So while sure. it's directed to physicians, anyone can use it. Yeah, same here, man. I do the same thing. I, I tend to, you know, focus on attorneys, but you can take that information and apply it to, to any profession, man. I really appreciate you coming on today, brother. It's been great. Oh, thanks, Seth. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks. Eric, my man, we're cut from the same cloth. I hope you enjoyed that journey as much as I did. Major keys, stop thinking your life is going to be different by doing what everyone else does. To succeed in this life at a level that others can't and others will not, you have to question things. You can't trust everything that Wall Street tells you. You have to think like a contrarian. You have to go against the grain, even if it's uncomfortable. And again, build multiple streams of income. The average millionaire has seven. Let's start there and grow. If you're feeling inspired today, reach out to me. Let's jump on a call, talk about your goals, and let's start building some alternative passive income streams together. I'll drop my call scheduling link in the show notes. Until next time, kiddos, enjoy the journey. Thank you for listening to the Passive Income Attorney Podcast with Seth Bradley. Do you want more ideas on how to generate multiple streams of passive income? Then jump over to PassiveIncomeAttorney.com for show notes and resources. Then apply for the private Facebook community 
by searching for the Passive Income Attorney on Facebook. And we'll see you on the next episode.